Okay, uh, so we're back. And in this uh, next section, what I want to do um, is actually introduce you to silviculture. Everything we've been going over so far this morning has been logistics about the course. So I want to actually give you an introduction to silviculture. And so with that, we'll start with what is silviculture. And so uh, I, I gave a presentation to all of you when you were in Forestry 111, where we sort of gave a brief introduction to silviculture. Um, I've got a briefer definition up on um, the, the course page here uh, that you'll see in D2L. But again, about eight, I think eight of you have already had uh, silviculture, so I'm sure you're already saying this definition to yourselves in your head right now. Uh, normally, I have you kind of work through an exercise where we guess the pieces to this, but that's super awkward on Zoom, so we'll sort of skip right to it. So it's the art and science of controlling establishment, growth, composition, health, and quality of forests and woodlands to meet the diverse needs and values of landowners and society on a sustainable basis. So there's a lot of pieces to that. And so what I wanna start with is sort of going through all the pieces to that. And again, the purpose of this introduction to silviculture is to start building up those file cabinets for you. Start giving you the context of how to organize all this diverse information that we're gonna be learning this week, that we're gonna be learning in silviculture and all the other silviculture courses in our program. Uh, Dr. Oswald teaches re regional silviculture, Dr. Kidd teaches hardwood silviculture, um, I teach intensive silviculture, and those are courses uh, you all may be taking depending on your majors and what electives you have. And so let's start with the, the scale that we practice silviculture at. Um, hopefully many of you recognize this location. Uh, this is right here in Nagadosha, southwest of town off Route 7. This is the airport woodlot uh, where we did the week four dendrology lab. And I'm using it because it's a pretty obvious forest stand. Uh, you could very easily put a boundary around this. You could use the road to cut it off or go across the road. Um, and so as we look at that, this is the unit we practice silviculture on. It is at the stand scale. So here's your definition of a stand. It's a contiguous group of trees. So we can see this is contiguous. It's sufficiently uniform in age class, distribution, composition, and structure, and growing on a site of sufficiently uniform quality to be a distinguishable unit. This is obviously a distinguishable unit. You could look at it, and there may be cases where you would want to split this in two stands. You can see this area over here to the right of this road is far more pine dominated than the rest of the area. You could split this into multiple stands. That is going to depend on your landowner objective, on who owns the land, and what you're trying to do. So there is no minimum and there is no maximum size for a stand per se, but what obviously limits the maximum size of a stand is just the land. Uh, we know the land in the Southern United States is divided by ownership into small pieces. And so land ownership patterns are gonna split up many of your stands in the Southern US. We know, for example, on our bottomland hardwood areas, soils vary dramatically in different areas. So soils may be limiting the maximum size of a stand. And then some of our companies are certified by Sustainable Forestry Initiative, for a Stewardship Council or other certification programs. And one thing many of those certification programs have done is put criteria out there so that stand sizes are smaller. So we end up with a more heterogeneous landscape, less potential for erosion and other benefits to some wildlife species. So there's a number of things that limit the maximum size of a stand. There is one main factor that limits the smallest a stand can be. Um, so if this was face to face and I asked you, you know, what's the smallest a stand can be? Somebody always says one tree, okay? But here's the question. Will a logger come out and cut down one tree for you and pay you a little bit of money to do it? And the answer is no, okay? So that minimum stand size is dictated by operability. And we're using a traditional sort of timber and wildlife habitat management where we're using a, a forest. Uh, when we go to an urban forestry context, you may be paying a company like Bartlett, Davey, or others to come out and manage one tree for you, but you're paying them. You're not making money on that, okay? Uh, so in a traditional forestry setting, a logger may come out, and if you're clear cutting a stand of large pine timber or large hardwoods, 20 acres might be enough. But if you want to stand thinned and they're removing pulpwood, they may want 40 acres before they're willing to spend the thousand dollars it costs them to move their heavy equipment to your site, get all the permits to drive that heavy equipment on certain roads, and then set up on your site. That costs them money. 
So if they're going to bother doing that, they want there to be enough timber here that they can harvest, that they will make money. And of course, you know, depending on how it's set up, the logger may be buying the timber from you. So the landowner makes money, the logger then sells it to the mill for even more. So they pay for their operations and then they make some money. And so the minimum stand size is dictated by what's operable, what you can actually hire somebody to do. Okay, so that's a little bit of breakdown on scale. Many of the things that we're doing in silviculture at the stand scale can be done at a landscape scale. So there's one system, say we wanted to make a bunch of different age classes in this forest. We could come out here and I could cut down all the trees right here and over here. I could punch a bunch of little gaps into this stand and then new trees would regenerate there and I would have multiple age classes if I kept doing that every 20 years or so. I would end up with all different age trees in here because I kept coming in and harvesting these little gaps. That's at the stand scale. Say you have a landowner with a thousand acres. They may now have 25 stands like this. You can do the same thing at the landscape scale. And now when you're at the landscape scale or the property scale and you're managing multiple stands, that is forest management. So you're gonna do that in our capstone course with Dr. Kidd, forest management. You can do the same thing. If the goal is say you've got trees that are on a hundred year rotation till they get to commercial maturity, you could do one stand at a time and do these uneven age civil cultural systems to get some money every 20 years, or you could simply clear cut this stand and then you've got another stand over here you clear cut 20 years from now, another stand over there you clear cut 20 years from now. And so you're kind of doing the same thing at a different spatial scale. And so forest management is at the property or landscape scale, silviculture is always at the stand scale. So, so forest management takes silviculture, takes economics, takes GIS, and it puts them all together for you. Okay, so we started with the art and science of our definition here. And so when we've got the science, you've got a lot of stuff you're learning in our program. You've, you can get access to a lot of journal articles. We know a lot about a lot of different scientific disciplines that inform silviculture. So here's one example of the science here. You can see I cited a forest ecology and management article. And what we have here is loblolly pine up here in this top line, slash pine down here in this bottom line. And this is above ground biomass. It's in metric tons per hectare, which is pretty close to tons per acre if you wanna think about it that way. And two levels of silviculture, operational and then intensive. Intensive added way more herbicides and way more fertilizer. That's why it was intensive. And so we can ask ourselves, how should you manage pine plantations? Well, the answer with slash pine is, if you manage it operationally, you can't tell it apart from lava pine. These error bars overlap. So they're about the same. So if you're gonna manage with operational silviculture, plant lava lake, plant, plant slash, probably doesn't matter which you're managing, okay? Based on these data at least. But if you're gonna spend a lot of money on lots of competition control herbicides and on lots of fertilizer, well, which species do you wanna be managing? The answer is clearly loblolly, which is gonna give you an extra, you know, call it about 10 tons per acre, uh, give or take. And so you're gonna be doing much better with loblolly. Loblolly is more responsive. If you give loblolly more water and more nutrients, it grows faster. If you give slash pine more water and more nutrients, it grows a little faster, but it doesn't grow a lot faster. And so this is an example of the science, which is one thing that's important, but it shows us a few other things that are gonna be really important for silviculture. So with the science on some levels, we can predict cause and effect, but here's the problem with silviculture. Here's what's gonna trip you all up. So remember, I showed you that office with papers everywhere. So already you're learning all this and you don't really have a way to sort it all out. Okay, so that's one problem. But here's the other problem with silviculture. You know, that, that disorganized office, that's how you're learning math, that's how you're learning other disciplines, dendro, all of this. But when you learn math, there is one right answer. When you learn dendro, there is one right answer. You are going out and you are figuring out how to identify that tree. And once you can identify that tree and you've seen the range of variability for that species, there is one correct answer. Silviculture isn't that way. I can take you out to two 25 year old pine plantations with the exact same basal area, the exact same number of trees per acre, the exact same size trees, the exact same stem volume, the exact same stem form on similar soil series. So similar region, Everything looks the same between these two stands. And the correct answer to manage one of them may be completely different from the correct answer to manage another one, okay? It's conditional. 
Now, in this example, it's conditional on a few things. The landowners may have different objectives. If one landowner just wants to make a bunch of money and another landowner wants to manage for bobwhite quail habitat and they're starting with this pine plantation, you're going to do two different things. So the landowners may have different objectives. The other thing that's going to vary is where your stand is located. Operations are going to be a major focus of silviculture because you can write whatever you want on a prescription sheet, but unless you can get a logger to do it, it doesn't matter. Okay? So you may be in one area where you just don't have access to loggers. Doesn't matter what you prescribe, you can't manage that stand well if you don't have the loggers there. Say you want to put prescribed burning out there. One of these stands may be in the middle of nowhere. No problem. You put a prescribed burnout on it. It's in the middle of land where you own all the other land around it. That landowner has all that land. No problem. But the other stand is right by a school and a hospital and a major road you may have major smoke issues and you may not be able to put a fire there. It might be right by an airport, you know. So the area around that stand may influence how you can manage it, especially with some treatments like fire and herbicides. Here's the other thing to consider though. What mills do you have around your stand? So if I have those two identical stands, but one of them is two miles away from a good sawmill, you may be able to do completely different things with that stand. You may wanna manage that stand for saw timber, your haul distances are short. Wood is heavy. It costs a lot of money to drive it an extra mile. You may make, make a lot of money on that stand right by a sawmill, but your other stand is 100 miles from any mill. Uh, you've got to drive that whatever you log a long distance. That stand, if the landowner's objective is to make a lot of money, you may never be able to make a lot of money off that stand because you don't have access to mills. And so that's how it's conditional. So ecologically, stand structure-wise, stand composition-wise, Stands may be identical, but you have to manage them in different ways. And then, of course, the other thing it's conditional on, you may have a 500-acre bottomland hardwood area, and you may have different soils on different areas. You may have different species growing on different areas. So I just gave you an example where the ecology is the same, but other factors differ. But what if the ecology differs too, in addition to all those other things differing? So the silviculture they practice in the Pacific Northwest, in the Northeast, in the U.S. South, they're not the same. If you go up to Wisconsin and watch them doing harvest operations, you, you look at the log trucks going down the road and you're like, what is wrong with these people? Because you see the log truck go down the road and the logs are sideways. The logs are perpendicular to the direction of the road and they're only eight feet long. That's what a log truck looks like in Wisconsin. Of course, in this part of the world, you see them, the logs are 40 feet long and parallel to the road. So different harvest systems in different areas. So when I ask you to find one right answer for silviculture, there isn't one. That's why we've just completed the only multiple choice test we're doing this whole week with that little polling exercise, okay? Uh, that's why everything is short answer because we need to give you the flexibility to pick a right answer. It may not be the only right answer. So the only universal ecological law is gonna apply here. You would have gotten this with uh, Dr. Kidd in ecology, hopefully. The answer to every single question in ecology and the answer to every single question in silviculture is probably it depends. If you put that down on a quiz, you get no credit for it, unless you tell us what it depends on, okay? So you have to add more to that, but it's conditional. And so this is gonna cause you a lot of frustration. Um, you know, if you come right out of high school, if you know, you've only been in college a year or two, you may still be in that mind frame of, give me the answer, I'll tell you the answer back, and we're good, I've learned the material. That's not what silviculture is. Silviculture is real world problem solving, and the real world is complex, so this takes problem solving skills, this takes critical thinking, and that means this is going to be frustrating for most of you. That's normal, don't worry about that. That's not a problem you're having. That's something everybody goes through when they're learning silviculture because it's conditional, because it's complex. And you see that even more when we get to the art of silviculture. So here I'm using a Jackson Pollock painting as an example. Um, this is a gap I went into in a forest up in the Adirondack Mountains when I was working on my master's degree. Uh, this was a field tech we had, Justin, and he's standing on this snag. He walked up. You'd be walking up this snag, uh, this down woody debris, and it would be on steep terrain, and then you'd look down and realize you were 20 or 30 feet in the air. This didn't even get hit by a tornado or anything, just a, a thunderstorm, basically, and this gap was messy. There was down woody debris everywhere. There were standing trees in the middle of the gap. You can see there's more gap back behind here. There were dead standing trees, just a total mess. So sometimes our ecology lends itself to the art of silviculture. We're dealing with complex ecosystems. 
where you know you may have to get a little flexible with what you've learned to apply it in a specific situation. Um, but beyond that, sometimes you have to get pretty creative to match what the landowner wants with what ecosystem you have, what your natural disturbances are, and what your operations are. So here's an example from a civil culture instructors tour I went on in 2015. Um, this is in Louisiana on the Sherburne Wildlife Management Area. It's about an hour west of Baton Rouge. And these two areas in this stand were like 200 feet apart from each other. And so this area is open right here because we're walking on a woods road. That's the only reason it's open. This area over here, um, you can see it's a much more mature stand. They have a lot of fern in the understory here. Whereas over here, you have a much younger stand uh, with a high density of small diameter stems. We had like 50 civil culture professors out there from all over the country. And we probably argued for half an hour before we all decided what the heck to call this thing. Because what these uh, foresters were doing, they had about seven foresters in this wildlife uh, management office. And what they would do is they would walk through the woods and they would try to hit each stand about every 20 years. Their objective was wildlife, but a really vague wildlife objective. They just wanted a diversity of composition and structures in their forest so they would get neotropical migrant songbirds, turkeys, deer. They didn't have a specific species in mind, game species, non-game species. They just wanted a little bit of everything, okay? And because of that diversity objective, what they would do is they would walk through an area like this on the left. And they would look around and they would say, I'm not seeing any seedlings in the understory. We need to start thinking about getting seedlings in the understory so we can get a new cohort growing here to regenerate this. So they would know, let's take about half the basal area out. That would be kind of a classical shelter wood. But what they would do in targeting species, if you were managing this for timber, there are certain species like hop hornbeam, hornbeam, mulberry, that you're gonna take out because they're never gonna be a dominant tree in the overstory in any rotation. Uh, but those may be good species for wildlife. So what they were doing is they were going through this area. If they had a sugarberry and 50 water oak, they kept the sugarberry and cut a lot of the water oak. If they had one water oak and 50 sugarberry, they kept the water oak and cut a lot of the sugarberry. So they were keeping what was less common, they were cutting what was most common so that they would have a little bit of everything out there in order to regenerate an area over here. Well, the, well then this person who's marking this stand walks over here and again, there's seven of them doing it. So they're all just kind of using their subjective judgment on how to make this a more diverse area. Well, they walk into this area over here and they look at this and they're saying, well, I've got big open areas in my stand here, but over here, this is a young stand. It's providing great cover for wildlife completely different habitat structures. And right now these trees are too small to harvest. We just need to let them go through stem exclusion. So I'm not gonna mark anything in here. We are gonna leave this area alone. This area could have resulted because they created an opening in the past 20 years ago with a harvest. This area could have happened because a hurricane 15 years ago blew down a bunch of the overstory. They don't care what caused it. They walk in there, they say, hey, this works. They move on. They walk over here, eh, we can make this better. They do something, they move on. So it's a very artistic approach to silviculture. They don't have a lot of hard and fast numbers beyond it. Uh, we finally decided that this would be a group shelter wood. The idea where you start with gaps of regenerating trees and you try to expand them gradually over time by taking out the overstory and areas beside them that look like this. So you would call it a group shelter wood, but each time they got a new forester in the office, they took, it, they took that forester out with them for a few weeks. They showed them what they were doing and then they turned them loose with a paint gun and said, use your own judgment. You know what we want. You know what's here. You know how to identify all these trees. You know, do your best. And so that's the art of silviculture. You're blending objectives with what you see on the ground, uh, with, you know, what is operable in your area. If they walked in here and there was a tree they knew they couldn't sell for the logger, they might hack and squirt it or something. They might kill it another way if they want it removed. So you have to blend that in, use herbicides, other tools where needed. So with the art of silviculture, again, you're seeing silviculture is complex. You really have to know your forest. You've got to adjust to all these different things we've been talking about. Um, beyond what we've been talking about, there may be emerging markets you need to adjust to, okay? Um, so, you know, we have the, the biomass energy plant up in Northwest Nacogdoches County. We've had students working at for a while now. When that first came online, a bunch of operators in the area started getting chipping equipment. They were gonna take trees that couldn't be sold as pulpwood, chip them, sell them to this biomass plant. Well, it didn't work out. Natural gas is a much cheaper source of power. 
So they rarely run too much and, you know, they didn't end up taking as many chips as they thought they would. But if a new market comes online, it may change what you can do silviculturally. It's hard to find great examples of this in the South because we have really great markets here in the South. But there are areas such as, you know, Arizona, New Mexico, in the desert Southwest, where they look at their forest and they say, this is what we need to do to this forest. The foresters know what needs to be done to better manage those forests for the landowner objectives, but there's no mills. Uh, there's parts of Western Montana like this, where they're like, we've got a bunch of small diameter stems we need to remove, or this stand is gonna get nailed by pine beetle. Well, why aren't you doing it? The nearest pulp mill is 200 miles away. We, we can't do it. The economics, you know, no one has the money to do this. Um, and so in some areas, it may just be if you get a new mill that comes online, that may often offer a ton of new silvicultural opportunities. So for example, in the desert Southwest, there's a lot of federal land, uh, Forest Service land, BLM land, and they're basically, to get mills back in that area, they're entering huge cooperative agreements between federal agencies and state agencies to promise private industry, if you build a mill here, we promise you 30 years of timber supply no matter what, because otherwise they won't have a mill and they can't manage their forests. So you can see the art of silviculture is just blending all this complexity together and coming up with the best, most elegant solution that you can for a forest. Uh, the simplest silvicultural solution that sometimes works is do nothing. Uh, don't put that on your prescriptions this week necessarily, unless you think that really is the best option. But if you walk into a forest and the landowner tells you exactly what they want, you look around, you're like, this is exactly what you want. You may not need to do anything right now. You may need to check it again in 10 years, five years, and make sure it still is what they want. But, you know, sometimes it's simple. Sometimes it's not. The other thing with the, the silviculture that we need to be focused on, this is an agriculture. So if you've got a farmer and they're managing corn, um, and they try something new and they screw it up, they lost one year of crop. If we try something new and screw it up in forestry, you know, in the South, that may have consequences for 25, 50, 60 years. Um, if you go screw something up in the Northern United States, the, the saying is they have short growing seasons, so long rotations. The saying is maybe your grandkids will figure out what your mistake was. So, um, so you've got the art of blending all this together, but at the same time, you don't wanna to get too creative necessarily because if you make a mistake, that mistake, you know, people could still be paying for your mistake 30 years from now, 60 years from now, 90 years from now. You want to try and avoid that. Okay. So that's a little bit on the art and science of civil culture. Next up, we want to talk about controlling. And one of the main ways we control a lot of these things is by removing trees. Uh, so this is a shear. It actually has a little pincher on it down at the bottom here. Um, we saw this on warehouser land up in Oklahoma. Um, and you can see the edge of a hard hat. I took this picture. There's somebody else standing right here. Uh, you know, we probably got an hour safety briefing on this stand. Um, and then an hour after that, we're for some reason standing like 30 feet from this thing while it's operating. So who knows? I got a good picture out of it. Um, but they, they were cutting pulpwood here. So they're doing a first thin, removing pulpwood sized trees. But that's how we control a forest in many ways, silviculturally. We cut trees down in a stand we want to continue managing. That's a thin or we cut trees down so that a new cohort will start growing, that's a regeneration method, okay? We can do other treatments that will get at some of these things. Let's look at some of these variables. To establish trees, we have two main options. Natural regeneration. Here's a cherry bark oak seedling that has come in from an acorn. It has naturally regenerated. Um, I should have put tallow naturally regenerating in here for Alejandro. Sorry, a missed opportunity. The other way is artificially. You could sow seed out there, we don't do that much anymore. You saw that done in the 50s when we didn't have good nurseries. Now we have good nurseries in the South. So mostly we're planting seedlings. So artificial regeneration, so planting seedlings. Okay, here's a machine planter. We've got a pretty cool drone video we've incorporated into this week in the FRC section, uh, showing you how these planting uh, crews work. Uh, but there's a person sitting in the cab back here. They feed seedlings into this furrow there. You can see a little longleaf seedling here that's been planted. Um, we had a student probably 2011, 2012 named Andy Kripe. Um, he had a great story. He was sitting back here in this planning cab um, and the, the person driving the dozer up here, you get jostled around pretty badly as you would imagine back here in this planning cab, it's a rough job. But the person up here in the dozer made it even rougher on him. Uh, they were planting an old pasture and there was a dead cow out in it. And this guy veered at it and hit it. And so it, you know, 
there's a coulter wheel here. It, it'll rip it in half. So he just got splattered with rotten dead cow. So, um, so if you ever end up in this job, make sure you're good friends with the person driving the dozer. Uh, it might not go well for you. Okay. So I showed you a picture of planted pines and naturally regenerating hardwood. That's an easy trap for us to get into here in the South, but we can also plant hardwoods. Here's an exotic example where they planted eucalyptus. Um, and we can naturally regenerate pines. You're going to get a lot about that later today when you see the pine silviculture stuff that we're focused on that's really longleaf and shortleaf focused today. Um, and so you can naturally regenerate pines. So it's not always plant pines naturally regenerate hardwoods. It can be the other way around. Growth, well, you guys just came out of a few days of timber estimation. I know you're going to get more. We can get tree heights. We can get tri tree diameters. We can estimate basal area growth rates. These are some Doug firs I got a picture of out in Oregon back in 2018 on a log deck. So you guys know how to estimate growth. We won't get into that a ton this week on the details, but by the end of the week, you will know the basal area factor of your thumb at least. So that'll be fun. Composition, that's the species in your stand. But with silviculture, we're gonna learn a little bit more about it than that this week. So here we see two stands, a pine stand and a hardwood stand, right? That's one way you can describe them. The picture on the left, this is a pure stand. It's all one species. 90% or more of it is loblolly pine. That makes it a pure stand. The stand over here is a mixed stand. You have at least two species in there with more than 10% basal area trees breaker, however you want to quantify it. And most of our mixed hardwood stands in the U.S. South are a bunch of different species. Some hardwood stands like overcup oak, we might have pure stands where that stand is almost all overcup oak, but most of our hardwood species grow in a mixture of 20 to 30 plus different species. Here's another way we're gonna to learn to think about composition this week, Lo. With our pines, you're gonna hear from Trevor Walker. They, we've been breeding them since the 1950s. And this particular picture, do you notice how uniform all these pine trees are? This is a varietal stand. Every tree in this row is a clone. And so every tree in this row is genetically identical to every other tree in this row. So when we plant trees that have been through a tree improvement program, we might know that all these trees have the same mother. We might know that all these trees have the same mother and the same father, or we might know that all these trees are just clones. They're genetically identical to one another. So even just saying it's a lolly pine stand, with tree improvement, we might be able to be a lot more specific than that. We can tell you where these trees came from. We can tell you who their parents are. And from that, we can predict what their form will be, how well they'll grow. So composition, our silviculture's got an intensive enough in the Southern US. We can start thinking about genetics within a species even. So that gets interesting. Okay, forest health. Uh, so we're not gonna ask you to dance or hop or flutter or crawl this week, but you guys get some of this with Dr. Bug, right? I've got a few examples here for you. This is a uh, red bay ambrosia on the right, uh, a fungus that's killing off red bay sassafras. You guys hear about emerald ash borer, insects and diseases. This is a big one we'll talk about this week. This is fusiform rust, a gall on lavalli pine. It's a naturally occurring soil borne pathogen. Uh, that can take out a lot of value in your stand, but I just talked about genetics. We can fix that with genetics. So health of a forest is going to be important. Quality is going to be important too. Um, if we were face to face, what I would normally do is ask you which of these is a higher quality forest. Um, and you know, you'll get mixed answers. Um, often people say maybe that's a higher quality forest, but the underlying assumption there is what are you managing for? Well, if you're managing for timber, this might be a higher quality forest, this pine forest in the middle. If you're managing for wildlife, that's not a high quality forest right now. There's very little wildlife habitat quality for most species out there at the moment. This stand on the right, I took this on uh, the Hall Natural Area right near Clemson's campus. That water oak was like four foot plus DBH, huge, sorry, not water oak, white oak, Quercus alba, white oak. But if you look at this stand, there's probably 60 species in the stand. There's big trees, there's leaves at all levels. If you're looking for wildlife habitat for many different species like turkeys, we'll learn about this week, this might be a really nice stand over here. So quality depends on what you want to manage that forest for. This pine right here on the left, if you're managing for saw timber or utility poles, that is a low quality pine. Uh, but if you look up at the top and it's got a red cockaded woodpecker cavity in it and you're managing for RCW, that's a high quality pine. So quality is in the eye of the beholder or as we might say in civil culture, it's in the eye of the landowner. So it depends on your objective. So we need to define quality. If we look in this pine plantation, and you're managing it for timber. This tree on the left and the right might be high quality trees. That tree right in the middle has that fork. That might be a low quality tree. So we need to know our objective and you're gonna get hammered on this in silviculture. You're gonna get hammered on this this week. What's your landowner objective? If you don't know your landowner objective, 
you can't really do a good job of managing your forest because you don't have a goal in mind. You don't know what you're trying to do. So it doesn't matter what you do. You don't know if what you're doing is getting you closer to what you want. So that brings us right into landowners and society. So if you've got forest landowners around here, they usually know a fair bit about forestry. Um, we're in a rural area, fortunate to be in a rural area. We don't have a lot of people protesting herbicides, any of that sort of stuff. But keep in mind, uh, we're, we're undergoing a census right now. I anticipate this number will get larger. Uh, but, you know, the United States is by and large an urban nation. Uh, most people live in cities or big subdivisions. And so many people that live in these large areas may not know much about forestry. Uh, they may see someone cutting trees down and, you know, thinking they're villains on a MacGyver episode from the 1980s, you know, the world is ending. Uh, but, you know, we know that's not what we're doing in forestry. We know it's sustainable. We'll get to that in a moment. The real challenge with landowners in the South, the U.S. South has more than 90% of its land in private ownership. Uh, across the nation, we have non-industrial private forest landowners. These are individuals or families that own land. We have 10 million ownership units, 94% by individuals, spanning 363 million acres. That's half our forested land. And that percentage is significantly higher in the southern U.S. It's going to be in excess of 70% of our forested land with about 20% owned by industry. Okay. And it's the majority of our timber supply. So these landowners are diverse in every aspect. Uh, education levels vary. What they know about forestry varies. Why they're owning that land, why they're managing that land, that all varies. Um, they do tend to be older. Uh, we know that from surveys, um, but some of them are passing land on to their heirs. Uh, most of you probably don't recognize this guy over here. That's Ted Turner. Uh, Ted Turner founded CNN, uh, TNT, so he's a billionaire. Uh, he has bought a lot of land. Uh, some guy just bought up whole townships in Maine, like six mile by six mile areas. So that's bumped Ted Turner down to the second uh, largest pri private forest landowner in the country. Um, so still, he, he's got the goal of riding a horse from Canada to Mexico on his own land. He's been quoted as saying that. Um, so that's one end of the landowner spectrum for you. The other end is a landowner that owns 10 acres and they have a house on it and they want to manage a few trees. And we've got everything in between. So landowners are very diverse and that makes uh, our challenge as a forester more difficult. You've got to figure out what that landowner wants and manage towards that. And of course, landowners are misinformed. Um, I showed this picture once to a group of uh, high school students uh, from, uh, I believe they were from Dallas, uh, and asked them what was going on. And, you know, words were thrown out, destruction, degradation, damage. Um, and then one kid asked me where the roads are, and I got real excited. I was thinking, man, this kid's thinking, how did they log this? Where are the logging roads? And so I was pretty excited. So I asked him, you know, what do you mean, where are the roads? And his follow-up question was, well, if they don't have roads, how are they going to build the houses? And so the only place he had seen trees cut down uh, in suburban Dallas were where they were clearing land to put in a new housing development. So people may not know much about forestry just because they haven't had the opportunity to be exposed to it. So keep that in mind as well. Um, depending on the land you're looking at, if you're looking at private land, landowners may have a variety of different objectives. They may want timber revenue to pay for their house and they may want to hunt it. So they may have a mix of objectives. When you look at federal land, we know it's governed by the 1960 Multiple Use Sustained Yield Act for our forest service uh, managed properties, our national forests. And so we know that included recreation, range, timber, watershed, wildlife, and fish. Uh, they mentioned the Wilderness Act in there, uh, wilderness. They didn't include it on that list of five. And of course, the Wilderness Act came out in 1964. So I'm going to go ahead and include it on the list. Think about silviculture. You're managing this stand of trees right here. Can you get all six of these out of there? No, you can't. Some of them just flat out conflict. If you want to manage it for timber, you need roads. If you need roads by definition, it's not a wilderness. So some of these things, you can't do multiple of them on one stand. So with all these objectives, we can meet them all on a landscape scale. But when you start managing a stand, you better have one or two, at most probably three objectives. And if you have more than one objective, you will not be maximizing any of them the objectives will conflict in some way. And so you're just trying to come up, again, this gets to the art of silviculture. You're blending those objectives, you have to come up with a real world solution that gets you competing things out of a stand. Uh, timber harvest may be good for wildlife, it may not be good for wildlife. It depends on what species you're managing. 
And we're going to see that with some of our examples this week in field silviculture. And that's just the 1960 Act, uh, so 60 years ago now. There are lots of other values we're looking for in modern forests. Uh, a lot of people like aesthetics. We had a management plan course, uh, probably 2012, 2013, somewhere in there. And the landowner literally wanted this one forest on a steep slope on his property managed for good fall color. Um, so if the landowner wants good fall color and they want to pay for it and it's their land, we can absolutely do that. We can do it sustainably. You can manage for species like maples and black gum. And that's never anything, you know, I think we would have predicted walking into that. But if you want to manage for fall color in East Texas, sure, why not? Uh, carbon sequestration. Uh, this sounds, you know, like something you'd see on the coasts or in Europe. Jason Grogan, uh, ornery old Jason Grogan is managing forests we've got here in deep East Texas for carbon sequestration for a European company, ST Microelectronics, that donated them to the university, uh, to our college. And so we'll see carbon sequestration here even in the United States. Wildfire safety has become a big one. Dr. Oswald worked uh, with uh, SAFE and we became, SAF became, or SFA became the first Firewise certified uh, college campus in the nation. And so there's lots of other things you may want to manage a forest for, and this list is by no means complete. So we have a lot of diverse needs of values uh, for these landowners in society. Okay, you've got the word sustainable in there, so everybody run out and hug a tree, right? So there's lots of talk about sustainability. Uh, one of the favorite things that I've seen recently, I, I got my master's up in Vermont, so I got to see uh, the quirky culture they've got in Vermont. And my take home from it was, it's the smallest state by population, it's small geographically, uh, but they came up with really big ideas to save the whole world, but they were all practiced at the Vermont scale. Um, so uh, I saw there was a university up in Vermont, uh, it had maybe 200 students or so, and the entire focus of this university was sustainability. Uh, most people had never heard of it. I don't remember the name of it, but it made headlines last year when it uh, went out of business. So it was a university focused on sustainability that was not itself sustainable. Uh, so when we look at sustainability, there's a lot of misinformation out there about it. There's a lot of people that use this term and just flat out don't understand it. Uh, but I think there's a few things we've got to focus on with sustainability. For an activity to be sustainable, you have to have a goal. In civil culture, that's our landowner objective. If you don't know what you're trying to do, you don't know how to get there. And so you have to have a goal in mind. Sustainability has to operate within the ecological capacity of a forest. Um, you know, you could write a prescription saying, you know, grow 30 tons per acre per year on this forest here in Nacogdoches County. You will never make that happen. Uh, that's beyond the ecological capacity of our forest. Six tons per acre per year? Sure, on some soils. 30? No. And so you have to manage within the ecological capacity of the forest. The final thing it focuses on is intergenerational equity, uh, where foresters, landowners in the future have the same opportunities that foresters and landowners have today to manage our resource. And so there's a picture some of you hopefully recognize, that's Gifford Pinchot. Uh, he was famous for his utilitarian philosophy, the greatest good for the greatest number for the longest time. Well, the way he envisioned this, it met a lot of these criteria. So that utilitarian philosophy is uh, founded on sustainability and it's right in line with sustainability, even though it includes timber harvesting. So are we missing anything? I'm gonna have to change this slide out here shortly, I guess, now that Dr. Cronrad has retired, he'll be teaching his last class for us in summer two, um, economics, so. But what are we missing? We haven't talked about money at all, okay? So here's a trap that you fall into with silviculture. We have a lot of pine plantations in the South. What's the landowner objective? Make as much money as possible, okay? Is that the objective of every forest? No, it isn't, okay? If you have a landowner and they wanna manage their hillside for fall color and they're willing to pay for the treatments and you tell them it's not gonna make you any money, it's gonna cost this much, and they say, yeah, I wanna do that. You can do that. You've given them the right information. You're doing it sustainably. There's no ethical violation or anything along with that. Okay, so look at our uh, national forest system. Until the 1980s, they made money for the U.S. Treasury. It was the only federal agency that made money besides the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, but after the Spotted Owl controversy, other issues like that out west, they don't make money anymore. So they may be doing things where the goal is not to make money. They're, you'll see that today. Uh, red cockaded woodpecker management in North Carolina. You're going to go on a tour after class here. 
And you'll see that they're, they're not out there trying to make money on those stands. They are making some, but that being said, every civil cultural decision does have to consider money because you have a limited budget. You could propose elaborate things where you're going to do a ton of fertilizer and weed control and all this stuff. But if you don't have the budget to pay for that, you can't do it. Okay. Uh, a lot of silvicultural activities that we know are ideal. I gave you that example out in Arizona or Montana where they know they have a stand where if they don't thin it, they're going to get a lot of mortality. They're going to get beetles. They're going to get fires. Uh, those fires are going to be stand replacing when they need not be if we could thin those stands down. But they can't thin it because they don't have the budget for it. So you do need to consider money with silviculture decisions. It's beyond the scope of this class and it's beyond the, the scope of forestry 347 silviculture. But once you combine those with economics and take, take management plans, you're gonna see how all these pieces fit together. So keep in mind, and I kind of fit that in under needs on this definition. So I've been using this filing cabinet analogy. This is one of them. There's our definition. You can see all these different pieces that go into that definition. We've gone through them. And I flat out stole this Venn diagram from sustainability. You can find this online where economics, ecology, and society with sustainability right in the middle, it works even better for silviculture, okay? Because we have a good definition of silviculture. I kind of color coded some of these pieces. I just updated this and looks like I need to do a better job color coding those. But unless you get the economics and you can put operations here, unless you get the economics and operation right, you can't practice silviculture. You can write a prescription for a stand, but if the logger can't drive out on that stand because it's flooded, you can't implement that prescription. If you don't have the money to pay for the treatment, you can't implement that prescription. You gotta get the ecology right, and we're gonna be going over that a lot this week, and you gotta get the societal factors right. Um, you're gonna see the Mineland Reclamation example where a lot of what they talk about is, hey, we wanna thin, but we can't because these federal regulators and state regulators have made us pay a bond, which is a good thing. That bond ensures, they, they pay a bunch of money, and unless they restore the land after mining it, uh, the federal and state government keep the money the mining company has given them and they use it to restore the land. So if a mining company does terrible things, goes out of business, the land just doesn't, doesn't just sit there as a big open pit uh, with you know, bad minerals on the soil surface causing all sorts of environmental damage. So you'll see an example there where they're dealing with a bunch of regulations and bond release and society's playing a major role in what they do silviculturally. So we've got examples of all this for you this week. So that's one way to organize things. Um, I know we've been going for a little while here. I just wanna wrap up a little bit with a couple other ways you can sort of contextualize all this information. Here's the civil cultural process. Regeneration treatment is a euphemism. People don't like hearing about clear cutting, right? So we're not, we're regenerating a forest. We're foresters, we're focused on the next forest. This is your major timber harvest operation that makes the growing space for the next generation of trees. So this is a clear cut, a shelter, what a seed tree, all those treatments. Then you do a bunch of stuff to get new trees established. When you work on the FRC prescription this week, everything you're doing is an establishment treatment. What herbicides do we use? What mechanical site prep do we use? What trees do we plant? How many of them do we plant? When do we plant them? Those are all establishment treatments. Thinning uh, is what you get to in the middle. You're going to see examples of thinning stands this afternoon for longleaf pine management. That's an intermediate treatment. Okay, so here's establishment treatments, different kinds of planting cabs. We talked about natural and artificial regeneration of trees, that's establishment. Um, this is an example of the mist blower where you're using that to spray herbicide. We'll see an example of that on a video. This is an intermediate treatment, applying herbicides in the middle of a rotation, thinning a stand in the middle of the rotation, pruning trees to make better saw timber quality in the middle of a rotation. These are regeneration treatments. Here's a big clear cut out west and you can see the new trees planted in that clear cut. Here's that group selection I was telling you about in bottomland hardwoods, where now they're gonna have young trees there, old trees here, all within one stand. Here's a shelter wood in the bottom, where they cut down about half the basal area. You're gonna see examples of shelter woods to restore upland pine hardwood stands uh, later this week. So they cut down about half the overstory, they let it seed in these new trees, they allow the shade from this overstory to keep species like sweet gum they don't want from doing real well down here. Then you come back in with a second harvest and cut them down. Some regeneration treatments take more than one harvest to implement. Okay, so that's the process of civil culture. Where are you in the process? And that's how my Forestry 347 course is set up. So we go through that whole process. The next thing I wanna get into is the intensity of civil culture, which is basically how much we can afford to do. We just went over how all budgets are limited in some way, right? 
And so we have different categories of silviculture. And today you're gonna to get a little bit of all of these. I'm gonna to tour you through an old growth forest tomorrow. That's a natural forest preserve. Today you're gonna to see managed naturally regenerating forests with longleaf pine. All day Thursday, we're gonna talk about plantation forests and Friday afternoon, you're gonna talk about agroforestry systems. So this week we are seeing this entire spectrum. And what you're gonna notice in these plantations and agroforestry systems, they're not very complicated. They're not very diverse. And we have them on short rotations because time equals money. On a short rotation, we can afford to do a lot of different treatments, lots of cultural inputs, lots of herbicide, lots of site prep. We can plant expensive trees that we've been breeding, but we're gonna make money because we're only carrying those costs for a short time before we harvest and make money on them. So productivity is high. We're trying to grow things very intensively, lots of treatments agriculturally. Whereas over here, when we're talking about turkey management, when we're talking about old growth forests, ecological complexity, long rotations, and high biodiversity are gonna be our focus. So think about what you want, okay? If you want a lot of complexity, you know, you probably don't have to do much to get there other than wait a long time, right? Um, if you want a lot of productivity, if you want to really make money off your systems, you probably have to spend a lot of money, get a lot of productivity in order to make that money back. So that's the spectrum of silviculture. And we've got both in the South. We've got a lot of extensive silviculture here. They're harvesting a mixed pine hardwood stand right here. We've got a lot of bottomland hardwoods in the South. We've got about 30.1 million acres of bottomland hardwood in the south, about one-sixth of our acreage here in East Texas. We've got about 12.1 million acres of forest land in East Texas, 2.1 million acres of bottomland hardwoods. So we tend to manage these on 40 to 80 year rotation lengths, longer rotations. Harvest revenues, people think hardwoods are less money, right? Because of the long rotations, that's kind of true in that sense. But when you do clear cut an 80 year old hardwood stand, you're probably gonna make twice as much money at that time as you would make clear cutting a 25 year old pine plantation. That being said, of course, you know, you're cutting one hardwood stand versus three pine plantations because you're cutting them every 25 years versus one every 80 years. But, but we're gonna see the diversity of wildlife values. We're gonna look at RCWs, we're gonna look at woodpeckers, uh, we're gonna look at turkey. So we'll see a few examples of that this week. Intensive silviculture. culture, here's another clonal stand. We're breeding these things. These are trees that have been bred for fusiform rust resistance. Look at that great form on those orange flag trees, the stand has been bedded, very intensive soil culture, lots of good weed control here. We have a lot of that in the south and it works. Um, I'll get into this more when you get into 347. In 1940, you would have had a naturally regenerated pine stand. And if you look at this thousand cubic feet per acre, if you look at each hundred cubic feet per acre of wood, that's three tons of wood. So if I look at this thousand cubic feet, that's about 30 tons of wood. That number is important because we can fit just shy of 30 tons of wood on a log truck here in East Texas. So in 1940, you would have managed a naturally regenerated pine stand for 50 years, and then at the end of that harvested one truckload of logs per acre, okay? Then we started planting trees. Then we started site prepping them mechanically. Then we started applying herbicides. Then we started deploying trees that we've been breeding. Trevor Walker's gonna show you the same diagram from the same source, a Tom Fox article from 2007 when he goes over tree improvement with you. And now in 2000, you know, on really good sites over a rotation, we're not harvesting one truckload of logs per acre, we're harvesting six. That's 150 tons per acre. And we're not growing that in 50 years like they were in 1940, we're growing that in 25 years. So we're growing six times as much wood in half the time. We've increased productivity by 12x over the past 80 years in the US South. We are the wood basket of the world. We grow more wood than any other country in the world does here in the US South. This is a major reason why. So our intensive civil culture is working. I'm not gonna go over this in detail, but if you're interested, here's mean annual increment in cubic meters per hectare per year. Here's rotation lengths, here's country, and here's total area in million hectares, but this is a bunch of other species throughout the world that are managed intensively. And so you can see uh, how that stacks up. L look at the acreage. We've got Scots Pine in Europe at 9 million hectares. We've got Cunninghamia lanceolata, China fir in China at 15 million hectares. But one of the biggest numbers here is our 11 million acres of Lavalle Pine in the U.S., Argentina, and South Africa. 
11 million hectares. And this number, this table is actually dated because if you multiply that by two and a half, that's actually only 25 million acres. Uh, we have 35 million acres of pine plantation in the South. So these numbers are even a little outdated, but it gives you a sense of the diversity of intensive civil culture globally. So you're getting a lot of information this week. What do you do with it? Be active in how you learn it. Focus on the learning. Take good notes and think about where it fits in our definition of civil culture, where it fits within the process of civil culture, and what you're trying to do. What's the landowner objective and how's that influencing the intensity of our civil culture? And that's all I have for you all this morning. So let me go ahead and stop recording.